Greetings, hello, welcome everyone, welcome to Dev Chatter. Uh, my name is Brendan, and this channel here is Dev Chatter. Uh, on the uh, stream here, we like to write code of various languages. Most of them are on the .NET stack, so we tend to be a C Sharp and .NET Core uh, location for coding. However, uh, our last stream was indeed in Python, and we've done a reasonable amount of JavaScript on the stream as well. A um, couple of times in the past, we've done some other languages also, um, but obviously it's not uh, the languages I use most of the day is uh, our C Sharp and JavaScript, so that tends to be what we focus on here on the stream, as that's what I'm most comfortable writing in. So, uh, I want to welcome you all here, hopefully you're having a fantastic Saturday. Um, I know mine's been going pretty well so far and uh, want to do a little bit of an intro, uh, but at the same time I also want to make sure that I update a couple of these other things. Uh, while we're getting started here, I wanted to jump in here and make sure that I can talk to all of you. Uh, so today, uh, we are not doing what it says right there. Uh, instead, we are going to... Hey Ace Flames here, welcome. Uh, we are going to be working on some coding exercises today. Uh, what do we want to, and uh, I'll leave that blank for what the first one is, uh, so we can figure that out as we go. Uh, however, as I said, today is going to be coding exercise to begin with. Uh, Ace Flames here, Miha, welcome. Glad to see you both here. Uh, is there a way to get an iApplication Builder uh, interface in a class library in 3 without referencing the old? Yeah, uh... Uh, Ace Flames here, I'm not sure if there is an easy way to make that reference. I would have to try it out and mess with it to fi figure out exactly what the circumstances are. Uh, but I think there's probably a reasonable chance that you can get away with it. Uh, greetings, SNB. Hello, hello. Welcome, everyone. Okay, so I want to get a couple of things out of the way first. Uh, and that is, um, we need some colors. So how about... Um, Colors for the stream. Let's make some suggestions, everyone. Uh, why don't we make this a yellow stream? We'll do a yellow stream today. Uh, so we'll do yellow there, and then uh, for the menu color, we will do uh, yellow, um, or uh, orange, uh, orange, red, and yellow. How's that look? Let's have a look at the menu. Um, not not terrible. I think I'd rather have the yellow as a highlight almost then. So let's do menu, uh, orange, red, orange, yellow, yellow. How about we toss the yellow on the bottom and make that like that? Uh, yeah, that's not bad. That's, that's a little, little weird. Might be a little bit too much yellow in there. Either way, I'll let all you mess with the colors now. Uh, so keep in mind that uh, if you just put in a color, you'll change this one. And if you use the menu command to change that menu's color, uh, you can put that in as well. Uh, for this one, you need to put in four colors. And remember, it can be hex codes or it can be uh, named colors. And same thing for the one on the side, hex code or named colors uh, work just fine. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So there's one thing I want to do. My plan today is to do some coding exercises. However, I want to do one quick thing, as this might apply to a lot of you, uh, and that is... Um, I'm going to jump in here real fast, and um, this is our Interactive 7 application. It's what allows us to do this. It's a .NET Core 3 application. Uh, for those of you that have been paying attention uh, this past week uh, to .NET Conf and everything like that, there was a nice announcement that came from Microsoft as uh, they did, in fact, release the final version of .NET 3. Now, we've been using .NET 3 for various stuff on this stream for... Uh, I, I don't even know how long, six months more or something like that, uh, mainly because we want to be able to use uh, .NET Core and build Windows applications. So uh, we've built a Windows Forms application that is system tray only. We've built WPF applications uh, that, uh, well, one of them is what controls this. So it's WPF and it actually has a hosted uh, ASP.NET site inside of it. 
Now, that is really, really cool to be able to use all this .NET Core tech uh, in, in these different ways. So, I am running the old preview bits that we had from before, and I want to upgrade. So, if you are someone else that has done this same thing, you've gone and grabbed preview bits of .NET Core 3, and you built anything with it, sometime soon, you're going to want to go install your updates to Visual Studio, which will automatically give you .NET Core 3. That's what I did already. And then hop in here, and I'm going to check that box to begin with and remove anything I don't want to upgrade, because I think it'll be a little bit easier. Now, a couple of things I want to mention. I opened NuGet at the solution level, and the reason why is I want to make sure cross projects, it gets all of these updated. And the other thing that you can look at here... Uh, that is, that is weird, uh, why it came up anonymous thing. That seems like a bug. Anyway, uh, Nate, uh, thank you very much for the, uh, 15 months of Twitch Prime. Welcome to the stream. Uh, so the, uh, the reason why we do that is if something is referenced by more than one project, which it's possible something is, but they may not be, not in ours, no, we were very careful about our references, so they all have a unique project. Well... Uh, in that case, let me go ahead and let this refresh. That screen was getting kind of wonky. Okay, uh, check all the boxes, and I'm just going to click update. Now, cross your fingers, uh, and we'll see what happens with it. Uh, Stool Painter, greetings. Good uh, good evening, I guess. Uh, it's, it's still afternoon here, but yeah, if it's evening your time, good evening to you. Uh, good morning to anybody, if it's still morning where you are. And, and obviously, good, good evening to anybody who it's evening for, not just Stool Penner, if it's evening for Stool Penner, obviously. <laughs> Let's see, did it actually update any of these? I have no idea. We're about to find out. Should reload the page, and no package is found needing uh, any updates. Cool. Now, the one thing I should have checked on before we did that, okay, I had no local changes. All right. So we'll bring this over here and take a look at what changed. Uh, so in the unit test project looks like uh, some minor version number upgrades on some of these packages, which we kind of glanced at and said, yeah, why not? Uh, we didn't expect, like when they're minor updates, I usually don't even check to see if they're breaking changes because it would be kind of, well, be kind of shattering if they, if they did anything that crazy. Okay, cool, here's the other ones. So these libraries all turned to 3.0, and we removed all the preview bits from them, so that's what we want to see. And in this one, again, some uh, slight version upgrades. That actually... That's on that one. Um, yeah, I'm going to assume that doesn't break anything, since I have a feeling if they broke it, we'd get a uh, compiler error. Okay. Either way, uh, let's go ahead and take care of this. So I'm going to open up the git shell and navigate us over into that folder that we're in. Uh, doo -doo, doo -doo, CD, dev chatter, and this is on stream, and this is coding exercises uh, with today's date. So, uh, whoops, nope, that is not where I'm so, why am I, why did I go in there? Uh, you know what, I'm just gonna do it through here. Uh, bring my changes. I went to the folder where the other stuff, where the stuff we're gonna do today is, uh, not the stuff that we're wrapping up today. So we switch back to master. I'm gonna create a new branch. We're gonna call this uh, Menrick, and it's Netcore three upgrade. So this will be our upgrade to Netcore three. We're gonna just try running the program just to see if it works, because that's um, there are uh, you know automated systems to make sure everything else works. But we also still want to just run it and see, because why not make the human check? Okay, so upgrading NuGet packages. And once we're done with this little upgrade, because I want to do this on stream, because it is relevant, everybody should be doing it this week if you have not yet. Uh, it is a great time to do it if you've been using .NET Core 3. Now, if you are still someone running .NET Core 2.2, uh, or 2.1, or 2.0 for that matter, first off, I'd recommend if you're on 2.0, you upgrade to 2.2, etc. Um, however, 
if you are on the the twos and you don't want to upgrade to three yet yeah take your time there there are not a significant number of changes but there are a handful uh, specifically related to the use of endpoints for ASP.NET sites uh, as opposed to using all the separate configuration for uh, your hubs and your controllers etc uh, so that is one of the things that did change is that they made it so that there's a nicer like endpoint control for that uh, and that's actually quite nice we ran into that long ago uh, on our stream when we first started using .NET Core 3 so that's why uh, you haven't seen it as in, in a while but just remember that that is a thing so um, just look for the endpoints and I'm pretty sure your error messages are going to yell at you about that if you do run across it so uh, I recall them being pretty good even in the previews so should be no trouble in fixing that Okay, uh, next thing I'm going to do is publish the branch. Now, I'm going to send a quick pull request for this, um, and then we are going to start on our work for the day. So, uh, I gave everybody a quick heads up that uh, we're going to be doing some coding exercises today. And actually, since I didn't toss them in there, I'm going to toss links into the chat as well. So, uh, feel free to uh, take a look at any of those if you like. There are links down below the stream as well. All right. Let's send in our pull request. So upgrading NuGet packages to, uh, th and we'll say .NET Core 3.0 upgrade. Uh, so the two things I wanna make sure I point out here is when I'm doing pull requests, I try to get the relevant information in there so anybody that sees this can tell what's going on. The big thing is that I upgraded NuGet packages so you know anybody that looks at this pull request can see that's what happened. Uh, but I also want to specify that there was a significant change, and that was that we switched it on a core three, uh, that we went to the final version. So that's something to watch out for. So because there was a warning here, that's almost what this is a, hey, watch this one. Uh, and if we look at the change set, we'll make sure that I didn't mess up. Uh, that is exactly what we're expecting to have in there. So, yay. Okay. We'll create that pull request. And then it will be waiting um, for us. Okay, so the stuff we're doing today, let me toss this on the screen. And actually, let me, even though we're not running this, I'm going to get it going. Okay, so here is what we're working on today. So for anyone that's never seen this, this is called Visual Studio. Uh, Visual Studio... <laughs> just kidding. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, we are actually going to be working in Visual Studio. I was just teasing about the uh, explaining Visual Studio. Uh, so what I wanted to do was uh, do a, a coding exercise, a coding kata style exercise. We haven't done one of these in a long time, and I thought it would be fun to do another one of these on the stream. So, um, So let's do it. Uh, the first thing I want to do is go ahead and add a NuGet package to this project. Uh, so I started this out as a class library. Uh, now obviously I want this to be a test project. Uh, do we get to use go-tos? Uh, Miha, if, uh, if by go-tos you mean uh, modern control flow structures, then yes. Um, if you mean go-tos like you put a label in one spot and you say go to and short circuit to the other spot. Um, I mean, unlikely that we're going to use those. Now, I, I will point out that um, one controversial opinion that I have is that there is a time to use a go to. Um, it is not something that, that never has a purpose. Um, however, it's exceedingly rare that you'd actually want to use one for anything. So, most of the time you're not in the case where you'd want to use a go-to instead of a better structure. Um, only, only very specific circumstances merit using one. Um, welcome, thank you for that follow, much appreciated. Okay, so I want to browse and add a new package. Let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to get output just out of the way for now. And goodbye, task list. And the error list, you can stay around. Okay, so step one. Let's grab XUnit. And now a lot of people ask me why I use XUnit as opposed to, say, NUnit or something like that. Um, 
So I used to use NUnit. I've used NUnit. I've used MS Test. I've used um, a variety of uh, different testing uh, frameworks at different points in my career. Um, and one of the reasons why I started using uh, XUnit for .NET Core is that um, there were plenty of people that uh, were using .NET Core uh, when they were creating, or sorry, there were plenty of people using XUnit when they were creating .NET Core. Uh, so a lot of the early stuff from Microsoft and, and .NET Core was XUnit. Now I had used XUnit before and I'd used NUnit before and I liked them both and I kind of sat there and I said, well, heck, if they're using XUnit for it, why not? I can use XUnit for it and it works great. So um, it's, a, it's a good system. So where to start? Uh, you can do a method call instead of a go-to. Uh, yeah, so in a lot of cases, uh, structures like while loops, for loops, uh, for each loops, uh, methods, uh, and things like that uh, take the place of doing a go-to. Uh, so in, instead of just going to a specific location in, in the procedure, uh, instead you can use some kind of structure uh, that is a little bit more advanced. Uh, now, there are some other considerations. So if, if performance is a concern, then you do need to be thoughtful about what structures you use. Uh, because some of the structures that we use in modern development are not designed for performance. Now, when you're just building business applications, I would argue that the performance loss on the more advanced structure is worth the cost uh, to make the code more readable and maintainable. Uh, however, you know, to each, to each their own. If, if you really do have an application that needs more performance, great. Uh, the other thing is if, you're, if your application is having performance issues, absolutely look into <laughs> changing the structure and how it handles uh, memory and, and execution and things like that. Uh, oh yeah, Miha. See, th that's the funny thing is I don't hate go-tos. Like, I'm not going to put them in my code, but I, I don't think that they're wrong all the time. So, uh, what is the last time you had a performance concerns in a project? Uh, performance concerns in a project last time. Oh, hang on, I gotta think back. Um, ooh, it's gonna be uh, yesterday. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Uh, actually, I, I'm uh, I'm working on a project right now where I do actually have to consider performance uh, because there are some operations that literally take hours to complete uh, in this application. So. Uh, in this one, no, we're not solving it with go-tos. Uh, I'm changing the way that the application handles a lot of the stuff that it does. Uh, so I'm actually in the process of improving the performance of an application right now. Uh, so yes. Uh, hey, Mr. Shoji, welcome. Uh, Nerd Rage, glad to see you're here. Uh, welcome, everybody. If you're uh, sitting around in chat not talking, that's fine, too. Uh, you never have to speak up, but welcome. Glad you're all here. Uh, most modern app performance issues are around network or database calls. Yes, SNB is correct. Uh, a lot of the slowest issues are either you're, you're pinging the network or the database too frequently or uh, for the wrong types of data, things like that. Uh, occasionally, the other ones that you'll run into is... Uh, someone is creating too many objects, like they don't realize the fact that uh, performing a certain operation actually duplicated a very large array or something like that, or created objects that they didn't mean to, or they're recreating the, them all the time. Uh, pseudo, uh, welcome, greetings. Uh, welcome to the stream, Surly Dev, hey! Uh, uh, sir, wait, er, even Surly Dev? No, Surly Dev, you don't have to talk if you don't want to. Uh, you, even you. And uh, Smart ASCII, welcome, buddy! I am glad you're here, and I'm glad you said hello. I'm looking forward to your stream starting up. Uh, you you said in the fall, man. Uh, lo looking forward to that. Mad Coder one hello, hello, greetings. Glad everybody's here. Uh, okay, so, Nerd Rage asked the great question. What are we doing today? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, Surly Dev, it's good to have you here, too. I like you, Surly Dev. <sighs> no, nah, I'm just kidding. Uh, let's go ahead and put this in here. So, we need to pick a project. Let's start with something easy. What's easy? And uh, we can talk about uh, C Sharp and stuff like that while we do it. Uh, and makes the testing uh, easy. We need a good starting point. Uh, hang on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mess up this name because I'm bad at, uh, bad at spelling names. Is it this? Okay, wow, I can't believe I got it. <laughs> All right, uh, properties of that window. Um, uh, I can type. Uh, we'll, we'll call it a, uh, we'll do that. 
and we're gonna do it uh, so my plan for today everything we're gonna do is going to be uh, TDD like you mean it so we're gonna start out absolutely simple 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 and and take all the steps and refactor as we go on each one of these uh, so that is gonna be the plan um, you've been a follower for some time just made it to uh, made a switch to another platform and found success so haven't shown much love oh pseudo uh, well uh, either way I'm glad you are here so welcome back to the stream um, but do you ever cover stuff with Node? Uh, so smart asking. We've done a little bit of Node stuff here on the stream. I think we did one episode uh, one time. I do mess around in Node sometimes. Uh, but part of the reason why I haven't uh, really delved too deeply into Node on the stream uh, with intention uh, is the fact that we do still get a reasonable amount of JavaScript on the stream. Uh, so uh, our last stream last week, we did Python. Uh, without specifically doing Python, we were unlikely to run into that. So Node, I can hit JavaScript without using the framework, if that makes sense. Uh, so like, um, it, it's a it's a way of getting that. So like, I do .NET Core stuff on here, but I don't see the need to specifically go out and do .NET Framework or to use Mono, uh, for that matter, because uh, we get the C sheet. So it's like, we could go and do that framework if someone really wants or we have a reason to. I'm not going to steer away from it, uh, but I'm not going to jump to it specifically without, without a reason. So... Um, we did uh, not client side, but well, sort of. I guess it, I guess it sort of is. Uh, we built a custom uh, script for a uh, Streamlabs chatbot last week. So normally in our stream and a lot of other streams, uh, developers build their own chatbots. I mean that's what I did. You know, a, oh, you know, a year and a half ago when this stream started. Uh, around then, uh, we were building a chatbot, uh, and that was a lot of fun. And uh, we actually did it intentionally to stop using Streamlabs chatbot. We built our own. Um, and we've built other chatbots along the way. There's actually a chatbot that uh, controls my um, lime color that is here. I think someone changed it to black. So now this is lime again. Sorry about the bright change. Uh, but that's technically a bot that does that. Uh, the control of that menu color there is also controlled by a bot. So uh, I have a few bots running right now that let us do that stuff. Um, and sudo, no, I don't I don't uh, bother with a follow which command. Um, TDD like a boss, yes. Uh, so, all right, I'm going to jump in. Nerd Rage, stop it. <laughs> and uh, SNB triggered the rainbow for us. Uh, so that's fun. All right, let's go ahead and do it. So I said I was doing Fibonacci. So let's make our first class Fibonacci. And some people argue with me on this one. Um, let's... Uh... Thanks, Nerd Rage. Uh, okay. What? Renaming it? No, it didn't fail. It succeeded. It fi okay, we're going to have a conversation, Resharper. All right, so I made a class called Fibonacci Series. Now, again, because we're doing this, uh, we're doing TDD exercises, I would normally create a separate project for the test files, but in this case, we're going to put them right in here and just test the same thing because uh, it makes it easier to just show it on the screen. Uh, I also could do a split window, I guess, but we're going to start this way. Uh, if we decide that we want to break this out into a separate thing, then we can. Uh, and we will say um, Fibonacci uh, series uh, should. Uh, what are we going to do with this? We're going to say fact. Um, Uh, what's, um, let's see, uh, return. So I am going to, so normally I would tell you, uh, I'm going to plan for this. I, I know that this one is going to have more than one number. Uh, so we're going to start out that way. Uh, test framework we're using is X unit. Sorry, I'll scroll so you can see that. Um, uh, number in sequence, uh, return number, uh, We'll say return numbers in sequence. Uh, and I am actually just going to make a method in here because I, I like code that compiles but fails with a with a with uh, with an exception of some kind. Uh, I don't consider a f the failing to build to be the first broken test. Uh, so if you're new to TDD, uh, the concept is that um, you want to create first a test that fails so you can confirm that you made it work. 
Uh, so let's go ahead and say public. Um, we're going to return back an I enumerable of integers. Uh, and yeah, we're going to start with ints. Because uh, they're the ubiquitous uh, way of handling numbers in C Sharp. And we're just going to say get. Uh, and I'm going to make it static. So, yeah. Not all code paths return a value, huh? Uh, let's do a not implemented exception. So we're going to throw a not implemented exception, and that is our uh, initial test. So we'll say Fibonacci series get. And we'll say take one. Okay. Um, so yeah, we're using X unit. Uh, Soner, greetings, welcome, thank you. I hope it's a good stream today. Uh, you've been dabbing, dabbling uh, with TDD and Python. Uh, oh, you've been following Brandon's stream. Uh, that's awesome. You know Brandon and I actually used to work together. Um, uh, yeah, so Surly Dev, uh, XUnit's a good choice if you are interested. Uh, either grab XUnit or NUnit and give it a try. Uh, hopefully you like one of them, but uh, they both should work well for getting your uh, TDD on in uh, .NET. Okay, so let's go ahead and... Uh, so ReSharper is reminding me that I have to install this SDK uh, into my project in order to make it a test project uh, to be able to do a runner. Uh, NerdRage, yeah, I'm not using JUnit in this, but if I switch to Java, I could. Uh, what's your view of MS Test then? Uh, so, Mr. Shoji, MS Test is perfectly fine. Uh, in fact, uh, when Microsoft came out with it, it matched almost exactly with the way that NUnit worked. Uh, so it's just different test names. So if you like MS Test, go for it. Uh, if you like NUnit, go for it. Uh, it really just comes down to use whatever one uh, you feel like. Did that not install it? Installation finished. I'm not okay. I think all right. I think it did install that time. Uh, run! Come on, come on, buddy! Yay! Okay. So the first thing that you want to do whenever you're doing TDD is not just confirm that your test failed. Confirm that it failed for the correct reason. Uh, so in this case, it failed because the method was not implemented. Now the reason we do this is sometimes your test will fail and it's not the reason you think, or sometimes your test might pass. Now in this case, obviously it wasn't going to, but, but when it does and you didn't expect it to, you really need to look and see what happened. Uh, because it's important to know that it can fail, otherwise the test can't protect you. Okay, uh, so obviously um, I didn't really do the test even. Um, so we're gonna say get and we'll say uh, take one. Let's store that in a variable. So, uh, actually, why don't I just say, f uh, yeah, I could say take one and then just say single. Uh, take one single. Uh, and we'll call this uh, number. All right, couple of things I wanna do before we get any further into this. Uh, so I grabbed X unit, but we're going to grab one other package. Uh, one package that I really like. Uh, do you use Twitch theme? Uh, no, I don't use a Twitch theme. Um, I have, so we have our own stuff that we built on stream. So uh, this, this overlay that's bouncing around, we built that on stream. Uh, we actually have a color switcher program that uh, really is something. Um, Mr. Shoji. Uh, not, uh, yes, it, it is, except that, um, I, I, so I can write it as first, uh, but take one single allows me to do like a skip one take, I guess I could, I guess I could always skip and take one, thing. I was going to put them in as numbers. Um, yes, in this context it is, yes, <laughs> exactly. Uh, so fluent assertions, uh, what, where's fluent migrator, no, assertions, there we go. This one. So if you haven't used this library before and you are doing TDD in .NET or .NET Core or anything like that, go grab Fluent Assertions and I will show you why. Uh, so it does a couple of things. The first big thing that it does is it changes the way that I write my assert. So everyone is used to this. Um, and by that I mean like um, 
you've done this before. You have written uh, assert equals number and one, right? And and you can recognize, hey, yeah, that's an assertion. Yep, and you know, one and number, blah blah blah, works just fine. Um, I like this better, um, and this is just comes down to preference. But I like to write it this way: number should be one. Now it doesn't make a huge difference. Um, obviously, both of these are going to do the exact same thing, uh, but I like reading this a little bit better. And because, you know, of the way that we write our tests and we have the structure of we always know the asserts are, are after the operation, things like that, like we know the structure we're using, uh, the fact that it's an assert doesn't really help me find that, oh, that's the asserts. I just know that that's where I'm verifying. So uh, it works out nicely. Uh, Ninja, hello, welcome. Thanks for following. Much appreciated. Um, unit tests are largely a waste of time. <laughs> uh, unit tests are not a waste of time, uh, but because uh, they can save you from things. Uh, but unit testing for the sake, for just to have more unit tests or get test coverage, that is a waste of time. Uh, unit testing something that you think is going to change or you think might be brittle, that is valuable unit testing. Uh, so uh, one of the best indicators of that is anytime there's a bug that you need to track down, write a unit test for it as that is actually the best way uh, of um, uh, making, uh, of putting a test on the correct thing. So testing something that has broken once uh, is a very, very important thing to test. Uh, and I'll give you an example. How many times have you heard a developer say, wait a minute, I fixed that bug already. <laughs> and that's that's the key, is we have all said, hey, wait a minute, I've already fixed that bug once. Uh, and that's the fact that they come around again. So uh, it's super, super common the number of times that developers say, I already fixed this. So uh, I'm talking with my boss, uh, and Bati, why would you write code to test code? Uh, <laughs> yes, that's a very common question. Uh, Number should be one also makes it really clear which is the actual versus expected. Yes, yes, precisely. Uh, someone else, yeah, Voigt said that same thing. Uh, so, um, less chance of mixing up the expected and the actual, yes. Um, in the last one, I happen to just know that expected is first and actual second, but if my framework didn't do it that way, it's hard to tell. Whereas this one, it's very clear number should be one, okay? So this one is expected to be that value. Okay, so let's run this. Let's make it work. Okay, not implemented. Awesome. Now we're gonna do a little bit of uh, C-sharp magic. If you haven't seen this before, it's gonna seem like magic. Yield return is a special uh, is a special thing inside of C sharp. Uh, so right now, this method returns back a series of ones that goes forever. I'm not kidding. You can take you can take as many as you want, and it always returns one. So yield return is a little special. I'm going to explain what it is. Uh, essentially, what this says is, for if your type is an enumerable. You can use yield this way in C sharp. And this just says, hey, return this value and come back to me when you need the second. So when the calling code comes for the second value in your collection, it'll come right back to this point. This basically says, hey, exit out of my, my method and come back to me when you need your next value. It's really, it's really powerful, it's really cool. Um, it's, it's a neat thing, but it is a little bit confusing to people at first. So just know that right now, every item in my collection is is one. Uh, because, I, well, if there, my collection has one item and it is one right now. That is the only value in it. If I take two, I don't get a second one. If that makes sense. Glad, glad to have uh, told some people about it. Uh, so if you ever run across yield, this is what's happening. And uh, we'll see how it works, because I am going to use it for this, because it's it's really interesting in this test case. So yes, all of our tests are green. That is correct. Uh, so once our tests are green, we need to do a couple of things. The first one is evaluate whether or not we think it's time to refactor. Uh, and right now, this code does not seem very complicated. I don't see a lot of repetition. So I'm going to say no to refactoring, and that means it's time to write our second test. So, I said this was a fact. Now, 
Um, a fact is the way in, in X unit to say, hey, I want to write a single test. If you want to make more than one test case of a test, you instead call it a theory. So you say, I have a theory and I'm going to apply data to my theory. So this is now a theory. You'll notice I have a red squiggle and that's yelling at me because I need to have another um, bit of information here. So I'm going to say inline data and I'm going to say uh, one, one. Uh, yes, uh, so skip and uh, actually let's start with expected. Expected and skip. Which actually now that I think about it, I'm betting I can just first this. So I think you're right. So we're gonna first that, but before we do that, we're gonna skip, um, skip. And instead of one, we're gonna say expected. Um, so let's do this, skip and expected. Okay, let's run this again. So remember, uh, we're, we're doing a, a change to this. We're green, so we can make a change. As long as it remains green, we're okay. But when it fails, we're good. Oh, whoops, I messed up my test. See, this was supposed to be zero. Almost like I planned that. And green. So, what does that tell us? We, we know that uh, the first number is one, uh, and, and we're good. So let's go ahead and make our next test. So this should be a failing test, sort of. So we're gonna skip one and expect one. Now this is going to fail because we just saw this fail. Oh, that's interesting, it came up with that one. Um, is, the, is the bot not returning the commands? Yeah, it's not returning the commands, huh? Uh, SMB, I'm not sure why it's not returning with that one. Uh, you work on a markdown parser written in C Sharp, and there are so many corner cases that you need to unit test to ensure that you don't... Oh, yes! Yes, exactly, Miha. Anything that deals with parsing, uh, any kind of information, uh, absolutely needs unit tests around it. Uh, one of my best examples is I've written uh, multiple applications that distributed revenue to people, and holy cow! Uh, did I unit test that like crazy? <laughs> I unit tested it so much uh, because we had to make sure that every single penny went to the correct person. So there's there's like written rules about like, okay, if there's this, you know, distribution, you know, like this money is being split among like eight people, you know, eight, eight different parties, then who gets the penny? You know, when there is a, a remainder and if there's more than one, and let's say there's like two pennies, who get them? And the rules are often like, well, the pennies go to whoever had the largest share, and they round up to the net, you know, like, they get, the, so it's like, okay, so, like, you have eight parties, there are five additional pennies, so the top five ones get those. Uh, so we never dealt with fractional pennies, uh, BSD guy. Our rules were always the pennies would go to whoever had the largest shares. Uh, so they would always get the extra penny. Uh, and it was just, you know, written in the rules that that's, that's the way it would get distributed, everything like that. So it's it's like, yeah, you need you need a bunch of tests just to make sure that every one of those pennies went out. Because, again, you can't deal with fractions. You have to have a rule. Okay, so here's the crazy part. So we're going to yield return 1, and we're going to yield return 2. Uh, so this basically says exit out of the loop, and when you come back, or I should say exit out of the method, and when you come back in, it'll go to this next one. Uh, so we can now take 2 out of this. There are 2 items in this collection. Let's see what happens. Hey, hey, there we go. So now it's green. Okay, right now I'm okay with this code. Um, we're grabbing the first item. We're skipping however many we're supposed to. Let's put in the next one. This is not bad either. Uh, so we're going to say the uh, second item is going to be two. Makes sense to me. So uh, I should say skip two, so... Yeah, item, item number zero is one, item number two, because, you know, we're programmers, we start at zero. Okay, so we got a sequence contains no elements. Uh, so that's because there are two items in our collection, and we tried to access the third item. Well, the easy answer to that is to just go in here and make that a two, and, right? 
that's going to make it pass. We all agree? So we're just hard coding in the Fibonacci sequence. We can't keep that going forever. That's not going to work. Uh, so what's going on here? We need to make a loop, right? Well, I guess, you know what? This still isn't that bad. Let's, let's add the third one and see what we get. Yeah, I think that bot might have died, S and B. So we need to we need to kill it. So one of the things that um, that uh, we want to do with that bot that uh, S and B is messing with right now, that is the dev chatter bot. It's the one we wrote originally. Uh, it's actually in a funny state uh, that I don't think I've told anybody about right now. But it is in the process of uh, switching to being a WPF uh, bot. So like our our i7 bot or uh, any of the others, it's going to become a .NET Core three. Uh, bot just like all the others and it is in that transition period and I actually is the first one we did that with um, I know I mentioned a long time ago to people that we were going to be doing that uh, and it is actually the one that we did that with first um, back when I talked about that being a crazy idea of let's put a website inside of a uh, WPF app uh, should be should be back up there okay so let's make this test pass so we're going to do the third one here uh, now this, obviously, that needs to get refactored. Uh, but that's fine. That's what we're here for. So we run this code. We take a look, and hey, everything's green. Cool. But you know what I've noticed? We're just returning back these numbers. Uh, so... Let's say, well, it's less than... Uh, I don't care what this upper number is, so you know what? We're going to do this for now. We'll make an endless for loop. So we'll say, while well, true, we'll start it at one, and we will yield return i. So here's a terrible thing. Uh, you don't really need to do this. Uh, actually, another thing about it, do I even need that? No, I can just leave it out, and then there is no there is no break from that. But I'll leave the true there for now, uh, all the same. This should work. Yeah, S and V. Yeah, that was that was supposed to do that. That was supposed to do that. I'm glad we got this. At least someone pulled out the shock emote. <laughs> I just felt like doing it. It seemed fun. All right, uh, let's let's uh, let's ease S and B's heart here. Uh, we're gonna do this. Uh, we're gonna say i is less than or equal to int dot max value. Uh, is there a better way to write that? Uh, uh, wait, if we hit max value, well, it's less than... Oh, because it was going to hit the top and exit. Smart Asky, thank you very much for the Twitch Prime sub. <laughs> that was unexpected, and uh, thank you for that. Much appreciated. Uh, now, now you have the shock emote that SNB used, so you can make that same shock face when I make a, an infinite loop intentionally. Yeah, that one. <laughs> okay, uh, so next up is the one where we break the test. So here's what I wanted to do. I wanted to show this point. So everybody notice um, right here that I started off with that with that with creating this loop. Now this loop is obviously wrong. This has nothing to do with the Fibonacci series because we're practicing a TDD like you mean it. So that means we work with the current set of requirements. These are the requirements. So that's, uh, that is the significant aspect is those are requirements and this passes those requirements until we have something else. Uh, there is no fibonacci -ing. Okay. So, uh, the, f uh, wait, did five, five shouldn't pass, right? Five didn't pass. Uh, oops, uh, five, five, it's five and four. Derp. Yeah, four, fourth number. Derp. WCF. You shouldn't use w WCF on .NET Core. Someone's using WCF on .NET Core. Can you still use WCF on .NET Core? I'm, I'm not sure if it still runs on there. Okay, well, test does not pass. This says we expected five, but we found four. 
Uh, well, that's because we're not actually keeping track of the numbers. We're not Fibonacciing this at all. So, uh, what do we need in order to keep track of this? We need the previous number uh, that we used, and we need the previous two numbers. So we could, uh, there's a couple of ways we could do that. We could either just keep the numbers, um, we could alternate back and forth. Um, We just need the current number, so we always just need the previous one. Oh, um, well that's actually, so, um, yeah, so BSD guy, there are actually a handful of solutions there. So I think it depends on what you're planning on doing. If you really want that, like, you know, it feels like we were, you know, persistently connected kind of thing, signal art is fine for that. Um, obviously, if you're really wanting to have uh, a nice interface to uh, talk with the API, that is a way to go. You can also look at GraphQL, not to add more, more onto your pile, but yes. Um, uh, REST API all the way with .NET Core. Uh, yeah, so uh, you can use a REST API in .NET Core. Uh, you could use SignalR, or you could use uh, one of the client-based ones. Um, yeah, so... And SNB likes GraphQL, but that is another another solution. Um, Miha's suggesting int A and B. Um, Current, uh, so current equals one. So let's let's let me think about this for a second. Uh, so I'm gonna hang on to this this current number. I'm gonna say it's one. Uh, so current. No, let's um. I guess we could A and B it. Int A. Uh, so A is zero. Uh, int B equals one. We could do that. Um, this one is return uh, A plus B. Why don't we store this as uh, as next? We'll ret and uh, return it. We don't need to do the next calculation until we need it, right? So what I'll do is this: after we do the return, then I'll set the values. So I will say a equals a equals b, and b equals next. So we won't even bother updating those until we're back in the loop. Which is a little weird. Uh, Death Cheddar! What's, uh, wait, what's going on? Uh, would the test still pass? I forget, there's built-in circular buffer data structure. Uh, yeah, exactly, uh, Icy Black Deep. That's what I was thinking too. I was trying to think, is there a way that I can have just a, a little circular buffer of just two values that you can insert one in and when you do, it expels the previous one. Uh, hey, the Michael Jolly, welcome. Yes, it's Derv Churder. Uh, welcome, greetings. What are the main differences between .NET Core 2 and .NET Core 3? Uh, so .NET Core 3 has had a, a handful of upgrades, uh, and some of the big ones uh, for a lot of people are that .NET Core 3 now works with uh, all of the Windows uh, stuff. So WPF, uh, WinForms, now it's not 100% on all of those uh, because they, they've still got some issues with like designers and things like that. So there's tooling and stuff uh, that still needs to get in place for all of these. Uh, but uh, we can run WPF, .NET, uh, .NET Core stuff. We can run uh, Windows applications in .NET Core. Uh, we can run WinForms in .NET Core. Uh, they also changed some things in ASP.NET. Uh, in that they uh, made some other uh, ways of handling endpoints. So there are some big .NET Core 3 changes uh, that you should watch for. 
Um, uh, I think Dynacore 3's also did some stuff with, uh, I think, think they made some changes to how background workers uh, function in Dynacore 3. Um, Sir Waffle, uh, you can actually use uh, .NET Core just period on Linux. So .NET Core 3 can, but so could .NET Core 2. Uh, so .NET Core just runs uh, cross-platform. Uh, in fact, it all works on... Um... No, 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 it's... Uh, .NET... So .NET Core is, is what runs on, on Linux. Um, so they made .NET Core SDKs, runtime, and everything like that. Um, but yeah, so the, the Windows stuff, the WinForms, the WPF, uh, those obviously aren't going to run on Linux, but yeah. Uh, and yes, uh, as Fuel Symbol is mentioning, uh, the Blazor server-side stuff uh, is part of .NET Core 3 also. So Blazor uh, had, you know, a bunch of release announcements and things like that. So if you were using Blazor, congratulations. Uh, it is now, you know, not just a preview thing. You can really use it. Uh, hang on, let me let me run this. Maybe we'll get caught in an infinite loop. Maybe it'll work. I don't know. This is what the tests are for. Hey, they pass. Nice. Uh, you started looking Rust recently. Um... Yeah, so uh, that is true. So C-sharp has actually been improving a lot of their syntax in the versions. That's what, what a lot of um, like new versions of C-sharp have been adding, is, is a lot of changes to how the language works. Now, a lot of people say that that's adding a lot of complexity because there's too many ways of doing things, um, which my stance on that is, well, you don't have to use them all. They were all written as optional ways of doing things. Uh, so I am a fan of it. I think there are places where it is nice to be able to uh, have these new ways of doing things, but uh, if you are just stepping in, uh, that is uh, a bigger challenge. Um, so Broken Sword, uh, that is a fantastic question. So max value is, exists on a lot of the primitive types, and that is actually just uh, a constant that contains uh, the maximum allowable value for that type. Uh, so max value, you'll find that in, in, in like date times, you'll find it in ints, you'll find it in all the numbers and things like that. And that is just there to prevent us from uh, overflowing the number. So we don't want to increase past uh, our top number and go back down to the negatives. Um, so, yep, that's all that is. Um, and yes, it is, it is the maximum value of a 32-bit integer. That is correct. Yep, and uh, that's a signed integer. So... Um, Obviously, if we wanted to go up to the biggest number, we would say, like, a, a, a uint would be the, the uh, whoops, not unit, a uint would be the, the largest of the uh, uh, int32 numbers, because uh, it'll get you twice as many, uh, which doesn't get you far in Fibonacci, uh, surprisingly, because <laughs> it grows so quickly. All right, let's add our next number, and this one might just work. Uh, this code might be pretty much done um, however I don't know how long before this gets too too big for the sequence uh, oh whoops derp 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 Brendan what are you doing so that's eight and actually let's put in we'll put in the next handful because I'm pretty sure it works six um, sevens 21 uh, and then this will be uh, 34. And we'll just toss those in there. We'll see how well it works. Uh, default interface implementation proposal issue on GitHub is... is uh, yeah, so the default interface implementation, uh, we've been talking about that here on our stream for a long time. It's super controversial. Uh, my stance on that one is um, I think the way that they implemented it is about the best that they could do. Um, and I understand the reason for implementing it. It is controversial because people can write some bad things with it. Now, the way that you run into a problem with default interface implementations is if you if you um, don't still treat them as interfaces. Uh, the default interface implementation is a convenience. It is to save you from having to create a very, very simple abstract on your interface. Uh, so if that's what you were going to otherwise do, just abstract to create one implementation of something, it saves you from that. And then the other thing it does is if you have a heavily used interface uh, and you want to add a single method to it and you don't want to have to go everywhere and implement it, uh, it allows you to still follow the uh, Liskov substitution principle uh, without having to go to every one of those instances and add a new default. Uh, and so uh, it saves you some effort in that regard. So. 
Uh, but yes, with default interface implementations, you can make some really, really bad code. So please be careful if you're going to use them. Um, what was one? Uh, you're planning on developing microservices on Linux, but you don't like Java very much. You're guessing. Uh, oh, yes, uh, Sir Waffle, absolutely you can do that. You can make uh, microservices on Linux using .NET Core, and it works really well. In fact, uh, it works really well to put them on uh, Docker as well. Uh, so if you are considering that sort of thing, uh, do do take a look at both of those as they are uh, good solutions for that. Uh, so, uh, Apo, uh, welcome. Thank you for that follow. Much appreciated. Uh, and anyone else that's uh, enjoying the stream, uh, be sure to click that follow button uh, so you get notified when we go live. Uh, but... This code looks like uh, it's working. Uh, do we want to just kick it up a notch? Um, let's let's go ask the internet for Fibonacci numbers. Um, For, uh, so we'll just have a list of these somewhere. Um, I want to know when it exceeds an int thirty-two. Uh, BSD guy, thanks. Glad uh, glad you're enjoying the stream. Um. Well, you know what? I'm just going to do this. We're just going to take a guess. We're going to say 30. There's no way that's right. Uh, whoops. Nope. Nope. Don't do that. So 30 is obviously not 34, so I'm actually just going to take a look, see what it is. Uh, Broken Sword, uh, you appreciate doing uh, your channel. You've read books. Uh, you've done a boot camp. Oh, you did a boot camp? Awesome. I have worked with a lot of devs that have gone through boot camps. Uh, and you've worked at a few jobs as a developer now for two companies, and you think I'm a good teacher, and it's awesome having someone that will answer your questions so directly. Broken sword, yeah, no problem. Uh, seriously, feel free to ask questions, everyone. Uh, that is, uh, ah, 47. Uh, if you, if I did zero is the first. Uh, thank you. Uh, so this number, hang on, let me confirm, let me ask the internet. Uh, so, internet, please answer my question. Uh, so I'm going to ask the internet, uh, Fibonacci, that number, will you just tell me what number it is? Yes. Uh, so it says this is 31. So, see, number 31 is this one. Uh, and what did you say I needed to go to, uh, Miha? The 47th? Uh, we'll grab this one, which it says is the 40th, which means on mine I'm gonna call it the 39th, because I index at zero. Thirty-ninth, uh, and actually, uh, so this is the number I put in here. So we're gonna put that there and just trust that that one was correct, and then we'll verify the next one with that. So we will we will trust that uh, that it was doing that correctly, and that it's not gonna have a problem until we get to about there. Okay, so they're all green, so that's good. And uh, Miha said the forty-seventh is this one. So here's where we're going to run into our first problem, then. Uh, you said 47th. Let's ask the internet for that number. Uh, yep, 47. Uh, that says 46, so that would be the 45th on our numbering, according to that. Uh, other, other way, so we'll try that. Uh, is it 46th? I think it's 45th for us. Or I misread. 45th. Let's see, how big is this? Oh, that's the, yeah, so that's actually the biggest. Uh, so we need to go bigger than that. So this would be 46. Is that still an int? Okay. Uh, so awesome. Oh, blue spied. Uh, oh, your editor config stuff broke with the VS update. Um, 
yeah, so I will mention to everybody that I do actually keep my Visual Studio up to date. Uh, so I did an update just today. Ooh, 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 did it do it? Cannot be converted. Yes, there it is. So this is the biggest one. So that's the last one we can do. Uh, so here we go. So now we have a long. And now you'll see that this has a problem because this... Uh, why did I put var in there? Use the type explicitly. So this is an int, and it's saying, hey, wait, hey, wait, you cannot expect an int to be a long. That doesn't work, which means we need to change that to a long as well. Okay, but that just converted it here. That does not... That converts how we store it. We need this to return longs. So let's make that a long, and we'll set that to a long as well. Oh, uh, whoops. Derp. Helps if we make these longs, doesn't it? So we're gonna make them all longs. Uh, so if you don't know, uh, a long in C sharp is just the name for uh, int 32. Or int 64, sorry. Uh, so int 64, you can actually type it as this. Uh, this is the .NET type right here. Uh, but the C sharp language uh, creates these shortcuts, uh, so that's what long is. So that's the shorthand in the language to write uh, int 64. Uh, so I like it a little bit better for primitive types to use uh, the the you know name that's native to the language instead of the the system type. But if you want to be explicit that that's 64 bit, you go ahead and use int 64. Uh, let's see. Those theory and inline data decorations are part of X unit. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Did, uh, did someone ask? Oh, yeah. Broken sword. Uh, you're very confused about the syntax of your class. Uh, why are they in brackets? Uh, okay. So yeah. There's there's two things there. Uh, so Voigt got the one. Uh, so these are called attributes in C sharp, and you can actually apply attributes to uh, classes or methods uh, or properties for that matter. So. Attributes sort of decorate them, and there's special stuff that you can do with attributes in C-sharp. Uh, essentially, these are getting applied to this method. Um, and the way that XUnit uses them is it says this, the theory is what tells it, hey, this is a, uh, a, a you know, a testable piece of, a, a testable thing, so you can run this with a test runner, uh, because it has theory on it. If it has fact or theory in XUnit, uh, that means you can run it. Uh, when you have a theory, you need some kind of data. So I chose to use inline data, but we don't actually have to do that. Um, I can make uh, a member data, and I can do this. Uh, so let's make I enumerable. Of... Can I do it this way? Um, hang on. Let me let me confirm the syntax for that because I want to show you this because it's cool. Um, X unit uh, member data theory. Uh, yeah, I just need a simple one just so I remember the syntax on it. Uh, because I can never remember the syntax. Where is it? Nope, member data. Nope, member data. Nope, nope, nope. Um, gonna, uh, no. Nope, I don't want that one. Uh, I want this one. There we go. Um, so I can do this as well. And we'll call this, uh, Fibonacci, uh, sequence data. So we could do something like this, uh, and we can, instead of having this structure, we can put all of this in here, essentially. Uh, and do this. Do. Do. And that, and that, and that, and that. Okay, so now I have uh, this, and this is uh, sequence information, so I don't need that top one, that's not part of the Fibonacci series, uh, but you can now see that I have a, a you know, Fibonacci, Fibonacci numbers that I can use, uh, and instead of doing this, I could instead say, uh, m whoops, member data, and say, uh, don't I just put the name in? Uh, oh, oops, sorry. Uh, yep, my bad. Uh, name of that. 
And so I can do it this way, and it works exactly the same way. So I can move the data down into here, and this just becomes the data that we use for that. Uh, so that's that's sort of the approach. Uh, so yes, uh, broken sword, exactly. Uh, this is a way of annotating uh, our our methods and func our, our methods, our, our classes, and things like that. So it's it's very interesting. Uh, so you can actually create custom attributes, uh, which Voigt is mentioning there. Uh, it is common uh, to use those uh, in C Sharp, speci specifically in ASP.NET Core uh, and ASP.NET MVC and those sorts of things, uh, because there are like authorized attributes and things like that that are commonly used. Uh, that's also how, if you've ever seen uh, any um, MVC code uh, or web API code, you may have noticed uh, that it is common to see uh, like HTTP, you know, actions like the get and the thing like that. Uh, Fuel Snable, thanks. Uh, how did you know we needed to get uh, a the thousandth number in the Fibonacci series? Uh-huh, totally needed to do that. Okay, I'm not a big fan of structuring the data this way for our use case. Uh, so I'm actually going to put it back to that. Because I think that is a little bit nicer. So, boom, we have we have a Fibonacci solver thingy. Um, yay. Uh, do we even use I anymore? Oh, um, sorry, uh, what I meant to do was this, um, let me refactor this, I did this wrong, um, long next equals that, uh, next is, wait, uh, next is, uh, wait, A and B, wait, hang on, A and B equals zero, N uh, next equals one. I don't set it here. We return back next, and then we sign B equal to A, next equal to B, uh, and then we say um, next equals A plus B, I think. So let's run this again and just make sure this works. Uh, so this is a little refactoring that I'm doing. I noticed a problem. Whoo. Yeah, that didn't work as expected. Expected two, but got one. Uh, so when we got to that, so... Oh, um, that that should be. Oh, uh, whoops. No, uh, it's because of that. I think uh, we don't yield up there anymore. I think I only yield in the loop. Is that correct? There we go. All right. So test save us. I didn't mess it up. So those tests show that I I have this working. So let's talk about what I just changed and why I changed it. Um, uh, also, uh, specimen greetings, uh, welcome. And uh, no, we will not know what the millionth is. And uh, genre shinobi, hey, welcome back. You made it to the stream again. Greetings, hello. Uh, and uh, just so you know, we do have a high emote uh, in case people do want to say hi when they get here. Okay, so. So this has changed things a little bit. Now, why did I make this change? Well, uh, it's actually because I don't want a for loop anymore. I want a while loop. And uh, that's what the while loop looks like. So now I can change my for loop to a while loop. While, next. Actually, why don't I put this in here? Why don't I make this next? Next is one. 
And next is going to be A plus B. Next is A plus B. Like that. <laughs> there we go. Did I just trick it? Did I just trick it? Uh, next will never be greater than uh, max value then. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I see black deep. I don't want to ever overflow the long, so... Um, uh, Voight, Fibonacci 0 is 1. Uh, 1 is 1. Uh, yeah, 1 is 1. Yeah, so Fibonacci is often written uh, as a... Uh, recursive algorithm, but um, you can also write any any recursive algorithm as a loop with uh, some kind of an end also, uh, and it works just as well. So, there you go. Okay, so I did a couple of things here. So first off, I want to talk about this because it's kind of an interesting one. So, um, if... Uh, if you take a look at this, I want to talk about how the for loop works, because I don't think a lot of people actually know this. Uh, so everybody can tell what I'm doing here, and this is uh, the first time when you get to a loop, it runs this initialization. So this is only run once uh, upon entering the loop, uh, and is designed for declaring variables. Uh, so hence you create your iterator loop. This next one is the conditional. Uh, and that you can use any conditional you like. It does not, like, we didn't even have to use next if we didn't want to. We can use anything that's in scope uh, to determine uh, what we want. But this, uh, you return back a bool. You basically put a Boolean value in here and decide whether or not you want to continue on the loop. And lastly, uh, this does not just have to be the, uh, like, you know, plus plus that we're used to seeing here. Uh, you can actually put in any code you want at this point. Uh, again, this can run anything. It does not have to be affecting the next value. Uh, I just did it this way because it seemed like it would make sense, and I think it does. Uh, so, uh, and for those curious, uh, you oh, <laughs> after the four, oh, uh, Jean Rishinobi, yeah, I'd be glad to uh, talk about what the yield does also. Um, if next, I were to trigger the Guess I could make it a U long. Um, that is a good question. You are correct, uh, Mr. Shoji. Um, uh, what we meant to say was this if next is ever less than A uh, or B, B is probably safer. If next is ever less than B, we run into a problem and we would need to break out. Mr. Shoji, you are correct. Um, and Miha, um, I love your thinking of casting the next to a Yulong, uh, but we actually can't get away with that uh, because we would have to cast it uh, before we did this addition. Uh, so we'd actually have to do that cast here uh, to make sure that, that it worked correctly, I think. Th I th th uh, oh no, actually, if we cast a negative... Uh, oh, you might be right, Miha. You might be right. Um, I forget whether or not that'll work. But either way, this should get it. Um, uh, Mr. Shoji, I'm not sure. I think we can just overflow it. Yeah, so the code works. Uh, let's run it. Uh, whoops, I didn't mean to debug it, but sure. Uh, the unsigned cast is used a lot through the BCL to avoid index checks by the... <laughs> well, there you go, see? Uh, yes, casting to an unsigned. At first I was thinking, like, no, because you wouldn't have the type, but no, it's going to be a negative, so it's going to cast it. Uh, you could try catch the assignment, and... Uh... 
Yeah, so Surly Dev, you're absolutely right. We could uh, we could do that, uh, but I think uh, I'm okay with either the exception being thrown because you went too high, uh, which I guess we could just you know end the loop at that point. Um, but I need to explain the yield. Uh, sequence contains uh, no elements. Let me just run this without debugging because I don't want the actual debugger. I just want to see error messages. Uh, so, yep, uh, sequence contains no elements. Uh, next is less than zero. Oh, because it is every time because we're doing this up here. So if we did it down there, I think it would work. Um, because uh, of the order of the checks. Because it checks the value first, and if we haven't added it, then then B would be equal to. Oh, uh, whoops. Oh, yeah, it's greater than. Derp. That's the problem. See? Crazy. Crazy sometimes. Okay, uh, so while well, next is greater than B, it should always be greater than B, right? Uh, greater than or equal to B. Whoops. Greater than or equal to because some t at the first at the uh, the so we do one and then one, so they're going to be equal at that point. So we can't get past the second item. Now it's right. So essentially, we want to say, as long as next is staying bigger than B, if we ever overflow, it'll be back down below it, and that's what would break us out of this. Um, the unsigned cast... Uh, nope, I read that already. Uh, check numerics, you can you get exception. Uh, yeah, so fuel stable's right. There are ways of, of forcing it to actually uh, check. Uh, yeah. Use ulong for all your variables. Still compare to long max value because close enough. <laughs> Yes, uh, you could absolutely do that. Um, either way, uh, I want to do a yield breakdown here. It is totally useless, but I want to use it for explanation. Okay. So that's why it turned uh, that turned that light gray color is because it is not actually needed. Uh, so I got asked a question by uh, Jean Rishinobi, and I want to answer it, and that is, what is this yield thing that you're using here, Brendan? Uh, okay, so a uh, little bit of C-sharp uh, goodness. This has actually been in C-sharp for a long time. Um, along with getting I enumerables, I'm pretty sure it came in at the same time. We have these uh, I enumerables, and this is a generic I enumerable. Now, uh, if you're not familiar with I enumerable, that basically just says, hey, I've got some data that is in order and you can enumerate over it. Um, I'm not saying it's a collection, I'm not saying it's a list, I'm not saying it exists anywhere, we might just be creating it on the fly, you don't know, but the point is you can enumerate over this collection, and that's essentially, uh, sorry, collection, you can enumerate over some data. I don't want to use collection because it's not necessarily a collection, it could be getting created on the fly, there's not necessarily data. Uh, so that's why uh, I, I'm explaining this kind of loosely. So. I enumerable is a fancy thing. Now, why am I being so cautious about not saying that there's a collection of data? Well, because in the exact case that we're using, there is no collection of data. So normally when we think of data, we think of this like contiguous uh, series. So we think of the standard ar array type data, right? Where you'd have, you know, this uh, actually stored somewhere, right? And you can think of that in memory and you say, okay, and the first block of memory is this one, and the second one is that. And, you know, you think of this being a contiguous set of memory. And then uh, that's one way of, of thinking of data storage. Sometimes your data looks more like this. And, you know, you think of the, the classic linked list approach, right? Or something like this. And, and you can think of, okay, well, there's a data structure here, and it's got a pointer to the next one. And, and you always think of data, you know, in, in terms of that, because that's how we think of collections in our brains. It's the best way for us to process it. It's how I think of it. It's how you think of it. Uh, it just makes sense. However, in this case, that's not what's here. And that's why I enumerable needs to be explained that it does not really exist. So here's what happens. When this code runs... 
Uh, let's show a different example. I will, I will show you. Uh, public void uh, example. Uh, thank you very much, uh, whomever that was that um, cheered in the channel. I will get to you once I'm done writing this thing that I'm writing. Uh, fi fi Fibo, Fibonacci series get. So this gets me an enumerator, so I am going to for each over this. Uh, thank you for that follow as well, someone. Uh, let's say long um, example equals number. For absolutely no reason, I just want to toss a breakpoint in there. Okay, uh, so first off, um, SNB, thank you very much for the 100 biddies, much appreciated. Um, uh, glad you're enjoying the stream today. And uh, then I also want to thank uh, Gentleman and uh, Xfios. Might have totally butchered that, but thank you both for following the stream. Glad to have you here. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know if I... Hey, it worked! So it did reconnect. Uh, so that there, there's some hype for that. Uh, all right, so we're going to explain how this works. And in order to make it a little bit easier to see... I am going to put this test up closer to the yield. So let's drop in a breakpoint. Uh, how about right here? And let's debug. Oh, whoops. I, no, 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 no. I did the wrong one. Stop. I meant to click on this. I didn't want to. I didn't want to run all of those. Uh, oh, sorry, icy black deep. Uh, yeah, the that's one of the nice things about coding streams is uh, we don't we don't change a lot of the screen, so uh, the bitrate can stay pretty low. Uh, that's actually another reason why I uh, I send out the stream at 720 instead of 1080 is that uh, Twitch doesn't always scale us. Uh, so because they don't always give us that, I know some people aren't on great connections, uh, and I want everybody to be able to enjoy the stream, so uh, we have not done 1080 in over a year and a half, because uh, people complained when I originally did 1080, and I was like, oh yeah, okay, uh, some people are not going to be on great connections, so let's let's lower that. Alright, so let's watch. Let's see what happens with the yield return, as I think this will explain it best, uh, because essentially what's going to happen is we're going to come in and out of this code. Um, and I think the debugger will show us what is happening. So I'm going to drop a breakpoint there as well, uh, just to make sure that we never miss it. Okay, so we create our two initial variables. So they have values. Uh, all are zero. We come in here. We yield return the value of one. Okay. Notice execution just moved. I hope you just saw this. We are now in the for each loop. We assign the number, and now watch what happens. So we get down to this curly brace. We're going to come back to our enumerator. We say in and grab the next number. Uh, I forgot to put the breakpoint there. So when we, at, right after we say in, you'll notice we're back. So we've come back into this method again. And notice these values, 1, 1, and next is 2. And so it returns back. We assign the number 2 into number. Then we hit the word in again, and we're going to jump back into the code again. So what it's doing is it's actually jumping the point of execution back into our method every time it needs the next item. So it is actually keeping track of where we are at this point, so up here, so that we can come back into the for loop after the yield return. So. Actually, I'm going to drop the breakpoint there so you can see what happens. So we come out here. When I go to the next item, so we're going to go to the curly brace, we're going to come back in, we're going to say in. It brings us right back here where we left off. So immediately following the yield return, we're on this next line and we're going to say, hey, that value A that you had, overwrite it with the value of B, store the next value in B, and then go ahead and cycle again. And we hit the return, it brings us back out, we spit out the next number, and then when we get to the word in again, we're going to jump right back up to here. 
So notice how it's jumping us between these two methods as it does this execution. This is actually how it works. So it's really kind of neat because uh, essentially it is a way of jumping your execution back into a method that you were in before. Uh, and that's actually how the uh, ienumerable yield return works. Um, the yield break is what says, hey, stop the ienumerable and tell it there are no more items left. And that's what would actually let you out. Now, the reason I don't need to put this here is because when you reach the end of your method, it automatically does a yield break. The reason why we have the yield break uh, expression statement that we can do here uh, is in case there's some circumstance that would break us out early, that is a way to return from an, ion, from a, an enumerable method like this. Uh, so these are special things that you can build in, in C Sharp, and there are some cool ways of doing it. Um, and Icy Black Deep, you're correct. We could spin up Ildasm or any other, uh, you know, decompiler that'll take a look at the uh, the intermediate language that's actually being compiled from this. Uh, and I can uh, guarantee you that it is fairly complicated, uh, and we don't want to look at that. Uh, so, yep. But hopefully that, you know, takes away some of the the scariness of of these yield returns, and hopefully that makes them make sense. Um, glad to have uh, shown you how that works, uh, Jean Rashinobi. I wanted to show it because I thought it would be a cool thing for people to see. Now, here's the problem. I don't have uh, an endpoint on this loop, so it's going to go until we hit that break. And it works. So unit test passed. So awesome. Uh, it's a class with a move next that has a switch statement. Oh, yeah, see? Uh, so Miha, that actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, so they essentially just need to make a state object to keep track of it. Um, and so in, in that case, uh, that is going to work very similar to um, the same kind of concept that gets created when you have a lambda expression that accesses the value from that point. Uh, it needs to create a new class in order to actually keep track of that state, and it does it behind the scenes uh, so you don't know about it. So that's actually when we were talking earlier about um, needing to know some of the ramifications of some of the, the code that you're doing when you get into a high performance scenario. Uh, yes, async does the same kind of thing, yes. Uh, so a lot of those create classes behind the scenes in order to do this for you. Uh, so essentially it's, it's a way of making uh, powerful things in the language, but still use all the same components that are available in the .NET framework uh, the whole time. Um, uh, smarty number one fan I'm going to go with. Uh, welcome. Thank you for that follow. Much appreciated. Uh, let's see. Um, someone else says, uh, says um, your job, uh, your job honey right now, and you're sticking with .NET Core, uh, at the moment. How soon should I change things up for the resume? Uh, you mean switching to, like, .NET Core 3 on your resume or something like that? Um, so my, my general guidance for people on resumes, um, uh, and, and for that matter, cover letters and applying for jobs and these sort of things, I'm, I'm talking with a friend of mine who's uh, applying for a job as well. Um, so regarding, uh, so, so, and, and this applies to entry level as well. So, um, which I can talk about specifically that one, cause there's some other considerations there. Um, so when you're applying to jobs, you want to make it clear to the job you're applying to that you are interviewing them. And they, so they know they're interviewing you, you applied for the job, but you want to make sure that they know you're interviewing them. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is whenever you go uh, and talk with anyone that you might work with, you need to consider whether or not you want to work there. The answer has nothing to do with uh, you know, the salary they pay you, obviously you want to get a good salary, but that's not really what you're always looking for. You're usually looking for a good environment, a place that you want to work. Now, that's not always the same for everyone. Some people like living on the bleeding edge. Some people like, uh, you know, improving their own code. Uh, so if you like the bleeding edge, then there are places that are always on the latest and greatest code. Uh, if you want to avoid the bleeding edge, you can go to a lot of companies. Uh, so um, some of the traditionally larger companies tend to move a lot slower. So you'll be on a consistent platform longer, and you'll usually change a couple of steps at a time. 
So you can consider all of these things uh, when you're looking for jobs. Um, but remember, make sure that they know that you're interviewing them. So phrase things in, you know, I want to find out whether or not this is a place that I want to work. Uh, you know, it's like, a, so you can say, I think it looks good and I like these things. Uh, but, uh, and, and yes, exactly. So as Icy Black Deep, it does a couple of things. First off, you don't sound desperate, which is always good. Um, helps you with negotiations and things like that. The second reason why is because it lets them know that you're considering that. Now, if I'm looking to hire someone and I think there's a chance that you're not going to want to work for me six months down the road and you're going to want to leave because I don't think you like the kind of place that we are, I don't want to hire you. In fact, I don't. even if I like you and I think you're great and I'm going to offer you a job, I want you to tell me no. If you don't like, if you don't like something about our company, company I want you to say no because I don't want to hire you and have you leave in six months. Uh, so those kinds of things are great. Um, your go-to follow-up question is, what is the corporate culture like here? Uh, so that's it, um, so it's good, but it's very generic. So that, that is a fine question. Part of the challenge is that every company has an answer to what is the corporate culture like. Um, a couple of questions that I like that are um, some a little bit better and a little bit less prepared for would be something along the lines of um uh, yeah so everybody has something like that and it's good to know it so that is a great question you can ask it but it, it's going to have a canned answer so it doesn't always it doesn't always get you really good thing uh a question might be um what conferences uh do your developers attend or what conferences do the developers usually speak at uh for example or uh, does your company sponsor any user groups in the area? Now, these indicate a couple of things. First off, is the company focused on training? Uh, do they want uh, employee retention? Are they trying to get their employees, you know, like continually learning? Uh, so those are some things that will get you answers to those questions. Um, yeah, so uh, who are you going to interact with on a daily basis? Uh, questions about um, pair programming or test-driven development. Uh, do they practice it? Um, things about their uh, build systems. Do uh, you could ask them a question about their build process? Um, like if there's a so if someone finds a bug in production, um, how long does it take usually until there is a a patch deployed and out for the users? Is a fantastic question. Uh, and if they tell you time, you could ask them, can you explain the process that goes through that? Because then you can find out, okay, how do they triage bugs? Um, how do they, how do they, like, is, is there a testing process in place? Uh, do, do they have QA? Uh, is, are there automated builds? Are there automated deployments? Um, so the answer I'm usually looking for is if there's a bug in production, it's fixed today uh, through automated deployments. There's regression tests. There's a QA person that gets to it uh, because the team has a lot of slack to be able to do that. Those are the ideal answers. You want, you want that. If they're not that, it's still okay. Uh, yes, Fuel Snable, you still want QA. Uh, a lot of people misunderstand what QA is. Um, it is. It is the person that is looking for the thing that wasn't so obvious. Uh, the QA is not the person that's writing the unit tests. Developers can do that. Uh, for the simple, does this work? If you aren't automated testing that, then then that's on, on you. The QA person needs to figure out the thing that we didn't test for. Yeah, so SNB has pointed out one challenge. So um, he'd love to go to conferences, but his companies don't, don't send their devs to them. So um, hence the question, if you, if you want to go to conferences, you need to ask the company whether they do it. Um, and yes, uh, Snoopaloopy is totally right there. You can absolutely ask why the position is open, um, which is another great question. So these questions aren't bad. They're great. They show that you care, okay? So don't, don't be afraid of them. They show that you care. So I don't want to go to a job where a bunch of people quit in a rage uh, or they quit because there uh, were problems with the project. Um, I want to, like, you want to go to a place of, oh no, uh, we're picking up this new, you know, this new project, there's a new endeavor we're working on, and so we're adding on some staff to do that. Um, MJ Tao, welcome, thanks for that follow, and, uh, Coding Gorilla, hello, hello. Um, how late can you come back from lunch breaks before getting a formal warning? Yeah, that might not be the best way to phrase that one. <laughs> uh, I, I, w I will say you could ask a question about that of, like, um, cause I, I admit I don't like working at places where, um, 
Well, I can tell you horror stories about uh, devs that I that I did not have to work with personally, but I have worked in the same company with them and had to deal and had to hear their coworkers' complaints. Um, there, I had a coworker that uh, was the only member of his team that was in the office before 10 a.m. And then at 11:30, they would go to his his team would go to lunch, so they show up at 10. They'd go to lunch about 90 minutes later. They'd take a two-hour lunch break. They'd get back and chit-chat for about an hour. And then they would work for the rest of the... Uh, until 5 o'clock. And so they got in a good, like, three hours of coding, or something like that, and that was about it. <laughs> and man, did he complain about that. So knowing in advance, like, if your team is going to be like that, I wouldn't be too big of a fan of that. Because there are still deadlines that you have to deal with, and, well, I, you know, I'm a developer to create stuff, not to... Uh, you know, sit around with a team that's not going to do any work. Uh, you tend to think companies around here will be kind of... Oh, uh, yeah, so I don't know exactly what, uh, where, where you are, what sort of things you've got. Um, where, where, uh, if you don't mind my asking, ge generally, where are you? Like, uh, are you in, a, like, you could say country or state or something like that? Um... Uh, SD area is that, uh, that that could be multiple things. Is that South Dakota, or is that San Diego, or something entirely different? Uh, San Diego. Um, yeah, so I don't have a I don't have a good answer on that one. Um, I would think San Diego's got to have a reasonable number of tech co companies that send people to tech conferences and things like that, uh, but. I guess it depends on where where exactly you're wanting to work for. Um, my general suggestion there is if you want to be if you want to work for a company that's more involved in the community, find the tech companies. That could be consulting firms or or the like as well. Uh, one question I always ask at the end is uh, I'm always looking at improving my processes and skills. Is there anything about this interview that you feel I can improve? Certainly, that is an awesome question. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so Fuel Snable's correct in, in one thing there. Um, uh, I can tell you that um, working more hours does not mean better code. Yeah, so uh, another thing is what, first, what Surly Dev is mentioning is you go to the user groups and find out what companies are sponsoring them because that tells you what companies, you know, actually care about the, the tech community. Um, some other suggestions. So uh, if anyone in here is an entry-level dev... Um, you may not have considered this, and this is actually something I used to give this talk at our local boot camps. Um, I'm not going to do the whole talk, but uh, generally the thing that I want to bring up, especially with newer devs, is consider um, what your role is within a company. Now, let me explain. You could be uh, an internal member of the team that is helping to make the company function, you could be uh, the company's product that they're selling. Now, you sit there and you go, wait a minute, I could be the product? Sort of, yes. So I've worked at a number of consulting companies, and I, I like consulting companies. Not everyone does. So when you consider what your role is within the company, that's going to change how you are treated and how the company uh, thinks about you and how things work, how your day-to-day -day life is going to function. At a consulting firm, the consulting firm is focused on, uh, a lot of times, uh, billable hours. So at a consulting company, I am, my, like, my job is to, like, and, and this, this is a very um, cynical way of, of describing it, my job is to work as many hours as I can. So my company is going to track my hours. Uh, and... Some people don't like having to track their hours and keep track of those sorts of things. Um, a lot of consulting companies will will say things like, you know, we need to get, you know, you need to have so many billable hours this month um, because that that's, you know, essentially the lifeblood of the company. And it makes sense, uh, but you have to think of, like, that is the goal, is making sure that I'm getting my hours in. Uh, so it doesn't usually make for a relaxed culture. Uh, at some companies, let's say a product company, 
uh, your job is a little bit different. So at a product company, you tend not to have the consistent like pressure of like make sure you're getting your hours in, your hours in, your hours in. That doesn't happen as much with a product company. Uh, so if your company sells a software product, it is much more common that it's it's fairly relaxed up until you get near a release. And then you get near a release and it's suddenly like massive pressure to make sure the release goes well and even right afterwards to fix all the problems that came up as a result. Uh, so you get those types of things. Uh, so these are points you have to consider. Uh, I've also worked for uh, companies where I'm building the internal systems. Uh, and those tend to be the most relaxed ones. Um, where you do need to make progress, you do need to succeed, but the exact number of hours and when you do them and things like that matter way less. Uh, so, you know, you're just building stuff and the money, co company continues to make money based on other things and you are not directly responsible for the money the company earns. Uh, so by that token, you're sort of in the background, so you're not quite as, you know, like, you're not as, as pressured for time and things like that. So consider that when choosing where you want to work is is just sit back and think like, what is my role in the company? What am I doing? Okay, let me catch up on chat. There's a whole bunch of stuff that happened. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, if you can suggest one thing for me to look at after this, what would you suggest? Oh, that's a good one, Mr. Shoji. Yep, that works. Uh, provided that we both feel I would fit in here, what projects will I be working on? Oh, that's another good one, Surly. Uh, I admit over the years I've found that I prefer to work for end users rather than body shops. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, that is that is totally legit. Uh, so there are a lot of people that like that, but that's that's the point that SNB is making is you need to decide what kind of place you want to work in and go there. Uh, something else, um, if you're if you're if the company's in a tech stack uh, where uh, you can find out what kind of people you're going to be working with, uh, one example is if you're on the Microsoft stack, if you're on ours, um, ask if they employ any uh, Microsoft MVPs. Uh, or ASP insiders or regional directors. Uh, if they employ any of those people, that's usually a good sign. Uh, I would also then find out uh, whether or not you're going to be able to work with them directly. Uh, so those are those are good people. Um, uh, but I mean, as ge as a general rule, uh, because they tend to be focused on on learning new things and sharing that knowledge. Uh, so those are groups that are are specifically knowledge sharing people. So that's that's the reason, right? It doesn't mean that they're a, a better dev. It means that they've been acknowledged for the fact that they share their information with others. And that is valuable to a, a, a younger developer. You want to make sure that you work with people that are going to share information with you. Uh, Mr. Shoji, timesheets are the bane of your existence. Yep, totally true. Uh, it's tough to find a good metric, hours, lines of codes, user stories, contributor. Yeah, so uh, that's the challenge. It's really hard to measure almost anything, so hence uh, a lot of times companies will do hours. Um, oh, smart of you, you're doing your master's degree. Um, I, I will warn you, some companies actually, uh, they see the master's degree, worry that you're going to want to get paid more, and the master's degree does not necessarily equate to better programming skills, uh, so uh, just be cautious of that. Um, you like just like do do a master's degree if, if you're either going into something where uh, it has value or um, you know don't always necessarily highlight it uh, if you think it might caught like make make it more difficult for you to get the role um, I just want to give you that warning um, beware companies that do releases on Friday as they uh, yes um, yeah because you don't want to work the weekend so um, that, so that question about uh, releases on the Friday is part of the reason why I was asking uh, why I suggested you can ask a question about uh, finding a bug in production, how do you get it fixed? Uh, because if they can just do an instant release, it's usually not as dangerous. But yes, uh, companies that do a scheduled release on Friday, uh, that's usually scary because, well, if you're releasing on Friday, I sit there and go, like, if you could release any day, why did you choose Friday? That's a really bad one. And they're thinking well, then the users won't be around the next day and we can fix it. And you go, wait, I don't want to work the weekend. So yes, that, that is a good suggestion. Aw, oh, Miha, thanks. I'm glad you think I'm good people. Uh, in the past, you've been on a 24-7 call, and yes, it sucked. Yeah, no, don't get stuck on those. Um, your best advice would be to get the master's after the job, yeah. No, 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 I'm not suggesting stopping the master's degree. I'm pointing out that you don't necessarily want to lead with that. Uh, or if you have it, don't play it up. Um, it, so, like... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> the content is thank you. I'm glad. I'm glad you're enjoying the content. I, I do always like these streams where we talk about uh, career stuff. 
Uh, this is dev chatter, after all. Oh, we're going to write code, but we're also going to talk about stuff. Um, best advice would be, uh, if you don't mind my asking, is this just a coding exercise you came up with, or do you have a good place to go for exercise in the future? Uh, so Blitzkrieg, we just decided to do this one, uh, but there are some places to go and do coding exercises, uh, depending on what you're looking for. Our Dallas Kata catalog. Um, so... This is a series of, of katas that were assembled by me and Steve a bunch of years ago. So you can do these to get yourself some, some coding exercises. So you can go here if you want. There's, there's some here. Uh, there are also whole websites devoted to um, coding exercises and things like that. Uh, this one's just one that we decided to one-off do. Because um, I was sitting there and I was like, well, what can we do in a little bit and just do some TDD? Because that's what I felt like doing today. Um... Um, uh, so detonated welcome thanks for that follow and anybody else that's in here uh, if you haven't clicked the follow button do so as that is a great way to get notified when we go live um, <laughs> smarty yeah uh, yeah no no uh, so smarty that's not a problem you can absolutely get the master's degree uh, I'm, I'm pointing out that there's a value in it but um, I, I just want to give you the warning that um, so at the right place they won't care at all um, at some places and they they will look at a master's degree and worry that you're gonna cost them more um, although in some cases you don't necessarily want to work at like I wouldn't want to work at the place that does that 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 um, that would think that way but the but maybe you do so that's why I point out I don't want you to I don't want you to miss that um, <laughs> Smart ASCII, uh, hopefully you're still here. Have a good one. Thanks for hanging out. Um, I'm looking forward to your stream starting up again, and uh, hopefully I will see you at a conference coming up here soon. So, take care. See ya. Uh, let's see. Uh, asking how much travel is involved is a good idea. Yes. Uh, so, with some jobs, you can just find that out, and some do post the information, but yes, if you want to travel or don't want to travel, it is good to know how much travel would be involved. Um... So, uh, another great, great question to ask. Um, for, like, standard development stuff, uh, that says not much of an issue, but, uh, for example, so I, I work remotely most of the time, uh, so I do some jobs locally, but um, a lot of times I like to work remote, uh, and it is good to know uh, how frequently am I going to need to go into the office. So, uh, if, say, the office is out of state or out of the country, uh, am I going there like once a quarter for a week? Uh, am I, you know, expected to be there every month is a really good thing to know. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, at other places, you are not getting the interview if you don't have... Yes, exactly. So Fuel Snable mentions there, uh, some places really do want the masters. So uh, at certain types of jobs, it... it, it um, it can be absolutely valuable and if you go to those places you want to make sure that you lead with that uh, because that's how you get the interview but um, figuring that out is the harder one so if they're looking for a master's degree as a requirement then yes uh, you apply there and mention it um, you learned today that async main is now a thing for console apps yes yes mr. Shoji yes uh, we have uh, yep I absolutely do that uh, all the time that got added in C sharp 7 dot something um, one of the one of the C sharp seven versions added async main and is absolutely useful for anybody that is building async applications uh, because that's your starting point. That way you can go all the way to the top and and be awaiting things. Um, as a hiring manager, uh, the master of science is not particularly a differentiator for me. Yes, as S and B mentions, um, I actually ignore your education section entirely. Um, so I, I used to do a lot of hiring for uh, services departments at companies, uh, so essentially consulting organizations, and I can tell you uh, whether you had a master's degree, uh, a bachelor's degree, uh, an associate's degree, or you went through boot camp, or your degree was in something that wasn't computer science, or whether you had no degree at all, do you know how much that mattered to me? It didn't. Look, <laughs> I ignore that section. I don't look at it. I don't care. Um, what I care about is whether or not you can write code and work with other people. And yes, I, I like those are critically important skills uh, that I'm looking for when I'm hiring someone. 
It is not just, you know, can this person sling code? It is not just, can they talk to people? It is always a combination. And uh, on top of that, I don't care how you learned. Um, I care that you can continue learning. Uh, you'd probably like traveling. Well, then that's a good thing. Uh, so you can find lots of uh, programming jobs that do require travel as well. A poorly written resume is uh, probably the main reason for a lot of people to not be hired. Um, yeah, so resumes can and can definitely be a problem among programmers. Um, and yes, uh, pudding. Uh, experience is the thing that shows that you know how to code. Uh, and SMB mentioning personality uh, uh, in an interview. And, and a lot of things with a personality isn't like, do I think you and I could be friends? It's, do I think you can communicate with the other members of the team and the client? Uh, what client could mean like an external client or an internal client. Do I think you can interact well with everyone else? Do I think you have um, the empathy to understand the needs of others and, and help them build what they want? Uh, those kinds of things are super important. Um, yep, uh, soft skills, super important. Um, and yeah, so... Um, so Smarty, uh, the thing you're mentioning is some people do have a lot of challenges with interviews. Um, I can tell you from experience, we put a lot of effort into making sure that our interview process removed some of those barriers because a lot of people come in very nervous, um, which is totally understandable. I'm, I'm a little nervous before I go into an interview, even if I think I'm like well qualified for the job and I absolutely think I can do it, doesn't matter. A little bit of nervous because, uh, you know, I'm there. I'm taking a bunch of time. Um, you know, they're evaluating me. I'm evaluating them. It's a uh, it's a stressful point. Um, let's see. Just got an offer for the .NET uh, team on a high school. Oh, with uh. Yes, exactly, uh, Miha. Yes. Um, there's no reason to look at the the education section uh, on that. I don't I don't care what your what your formal education background is. Uh, because uh, I can tell you from experience that uh, I've worked with great developers that had no degree, great developers that had degrees in, you know, English, great developers that had, uh, um, I don't know, certificates from a, from a, a boot camp. I don't know what to call that. Um, I've worked with great developers that have bachelor's degrees, great developers that have master's degrees, etc. It doesn't really matter, um, you know, the what you can contribute to a development team it is not usually a reference of that what piece of paper you happen to have. Um, so we did a contract uh, a couple of jobs ago. Had a guy had gone to university and obviously learned a lot, uh, but to me it seemed he spent most of the time walking around the office telling people what he had learned, how things should be, best practices. Um, yeah, so um, that that is one concern. So. Um, I want to talk to you all about uh, something something interesting um, on a on a team. So, we talked about how companies try to measure things like uh, time you spent on things, lines of code, or other stuff. Like, there's ways of trying to measure the efforts of devs, or how many cards did you finish. My piece of advice for any of you, especially if you are a team lead. Do not measure individual performance. Um, do not measure individual performance. The developers on the team can tell who is contributing and who is not, um, and hopefully solve that internally. Um, next, I want to remind you, don't measure individual performance, and uh, lastly, don't measure individual performance. You want to measure team performance. Uh, and the reason I say this, I have worked with some developers that were fantastic and would never get their own work done because they were going around and helping everyone else get their the, the other work done instead. Uh, so some of the smartest developers I've worked for get pulled in all the time for help with stuff. And you sit there and you go, okay, well, if my team is self-organizing, then anyone can take a task and work on it. It doesn't have to be that like that certain person. So you'd say, but they're never getting their own work done. It's like, well, essentially they don't have work. They have teamwork. Uh, and so... Uh, like those kinds of things, you'd measure that person, say they're terrible, but they're the most valuable member of the team. 
So always keep that in mind that you want to measure how the team is doing, not the individuals, because it doesn't tell the whole story all the time. Um, and, you know... Uh, Alright, let me catch up on this. Uh, I'm pretty sure you could develop into tricky questions. Uh, yeah. What kind of coding challenges do you give uh, your interviewers? Uh, oh, coding challenges are never intended to be tricky in an interview. Uh, coding challenges just to see how you approach and think about a problem. It is They're always supposed to be ones that you can easily solve in a short period of time and are not difficult. Uh, a difficult problem just tells you whether or not, like, under the pressure of an interview, they can stay calm and solve a problem. It's assumed they can solve those kinds of problems. Um, you just want to see the approach they take. So um, doing a simple thing lets me know, was their first thought to unit test this? Um, you know, was they, like... Essentially, it's what steps do they try to take? Like, do they do they run to see if code works on a periodic basis, or do they, do they try to finish the whole thing? Do they ask questions? Do they write stuff down? Do they rubber duck things? And so there's all these kinds of little checks that you can find out. You can learn about someone's development process where they could be doing the simplest code in the world. It doesn't matter. You could have them do something they've done before. It doesn't matter. Um, the code matters way less than the approach they take to solving it. Pretty code is a big technical gray area. The big, uh, so uh, putting your, you're absolutely right, um, but even even more than that is we all disagree on what pretty code is. Um, it is not all the same to all people. Uh, depends if it's an obsess or two. Uh, and yes, um, uh, Mr. Shoji is correct. It does depend. I'm thinking in office, but yes, if, if they're taken home, you can't see the approach they took. Uh, so um, you could add some complexity to that. I'm not huge on, on take home programming exercises either. Uh, education can have IQ tests and whatnot. Are signals used to help you differentiate lemons from oranges? Uh, when you have... Uh, yeah, so fuel snable is correct. So um, essentially uh, for that, you're, you're, like, there, there is some, some value in, in some aspects of whether or not someone has an education. Um, that's correct, Surly Dev. I don't think that uh, measuring individual performance is a good thing. Um, because uh, the problem is you can end up with someone caring more about their own work than the team's effort, and you want the team to succeed, not the individual. Um, Mark the other day about how important uh, flexibility versus making code easy to read and understand. Yeah, so putting there is a fine balance there. Um, you want the code to be maintainable and readable. Uh, those are, are both very important, and they don't always line up. That is correct. Um, one team leader told you to stop being so eager to help other people achieve their targets at the expense of your own. See, that's the silly thing, is Surly Dev, um, I would say you're not talking about a team leader at that point. You're talking about, like, a team manager. Now, um, the question is, uh, like, how much more work gets done if you help someone else versus getting your own uh, work done? Um, which... It's, it's tough to say. But if the team is all working on the same workload and you're not individually doling out tasks, if you dole out tasks to everyone, then yeah, you're not getting your own stuff done, at which point priorities need to shift. Everybody needs to be able to take cards from a single bucket and work on them. And if you take that approach, then uh, teamwork works a lot better. Uh, Smarty, have a good one. Uh, thank you for stopping by. Uh, you brought up some great questions, actually. Uh, when it interviews, uh, where you do a wishy-washy interview and the interviewer tells you you're good for the job because they're so good at reading. Uh, Fuel Snable. Um, yeah, so in those situations, I think they're looking for someone that has a pulse. And you had a pulse. They might have checked you. Uh, the best way to avoid writing bad code is to st stick to no code. <laughs> Specimen, you're not wrong. Uh, unwritten code is bug-free code. Um... Helps to know the industry you're writing code for. Uh, yes, uh, and, and in multiple ways, Snoopa Loopy. Um, in multiple ways. Uh, that, that could be like, uh, if, if you're writing code for other developers, that's a different kind of code from writing code that is just going to be in a product. Um, writing code that's going to be changing frequently uh, needs, needs different things. If your code is for a game, you might have to care about real-time performance, uh, whereas you don't in a web application, for example. A web app, like, you need to not be slow in your response, but, like, um, a lot of individual things matter a lot less. Uh, you had a job interview for a Node.js dev that uh, they had you do a test on Zebra printer language. 
I don't even know what that. I don't even know what that is. Lichen. I don't. <laughs> I I have no idea. Uh, but yeah, um, I have done interviews in languages that I didn't know. Uh, so I've I've interviewed plenty of people where I've asked them to write C sharp and they didn't know C sharp. And I but before I would have like if they didn't know any C based language, I'd let them use whatever they wanted. Uh, but if they knew Python, C, uh, C or C plus plus, Java like any of that, or JavaScript even for that matter. Um, if you know any of those, you're familiar with, you're familiar enough with the syntax of C-sharp and Visual Studio does so much for you that like for a simple program, you know, you can just say, hey, I know you don't know the language, so just ask me syntax questions. Like, how do you make a for loop? How do you, you know, how do you define a variable? And I'll just tell you the Visual Studio, like, snippet code, and you'll just put it in and be like, yeah, here, is that good enough? Like, I, and I can explain the syntax. And I don't care if you don't know the syntax. So that's the neat thing is, like, if, if you've got the right tooling and the right approach, it doesn't matter what language the dev uh, has their background in. Um, oh, yes. Yes, uh, so Snoopaloopy is totally correct. If so, I can tell you a crap ton about how advertising works. I know tons about advertising. Why do I know so much about advertising? Um, I have written multiple advertising engines uh, that are on the internet and serve ads. I have done that. One of them got retired a bunch of years ago. I uh, used to run ads on, on all the various, like, developer websites, so uh, never any pop-ups or anything like that, so don't get mad at me. Uh, they're the ones that made those publisher sites be able to afford to produce the content that was available for the community to read for free. It essentially funded, like, the community educators. Uh, so don't don't shy away from advertising. It's it's absolutely useful. Uh, thanks for that follow, Snoopy Loopy. So I know tons about the advertising industry thanks to having worked at multiple advertising companies. Um... I have worked in, uh, well, let's see, I've worked for uh, companies that, you know, did newsletters for religious organizations. I've, you know, I've worked with uh, investment firms. Um, I've worked in legal stuff. What was the ad stuff? Uh, Surly Dev. Uh, yeah, so you know that Steve used to own an advertising company? Hi, I'm the developer that wrote the advertising engine for Steve's advertising company. Uh, so, yep, Surly Dev, that, that's that's how I met Steve. I, I, I did, in fact, build that advertising engine for him. Uh, <laughs> and I love that you figured that out. Uh, if you have skills that someone else can benefit from, uh, then you like to help... Uh, you think a company or team has a whole nowadays against something? Uh, Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, seriously though, teamwork. It is all about teamwork. Uh, Snoopaloopy, glad you've enjoyed the discussion. And, uh, yeah. So, yep, yeah, I, I worked with Steve Smith at a uh, company that he owned. Uh, very, very good organization. So, only, on, only every once in a while would Steve sell stuff that uh, didn't exist. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna throw them under the bus here. Um, every once in a while, we would we would get. Um... <laughs> yeah, exactly, Miha. I spent two hours on Fibonacci, uh, and by that we mean it it took probably like you know I, I don't know how much time really like 15 20 minutes to actually write Fibonacci um, with a whole bunch of conversations going on while we were writing it, and then afterwards I don't actually know how long it took to write because uh, I wasn't really paying attention, but we could trim down to only the parts where we were writing the code uh, and take a look at it. <clears throat> uh, but, so the the funny thing is that every once in a while Steve would sell something that didn't actually exist, and, and then I would be like, okay, when's that when's that campaign go live? By by when does this new feature need to be out there? And now the, the funny thing is, so we're actually talking a uh, long time ago, like... like 12, 12, 13 years ago, um, and uh, so for anybody that is wondering about like automated builds and things like that, um, we actually had automated builds for all all of that. So ran all of our unit tests or integration tests, uh, you know, did all of our deployments and everything like that automatically to all the various you know stages, you know, to our QA environments, our test environments, our our staging environments would you know 
flip over to production with the push of a button. Uh, and we did all that back then. Uh, so if you're struggling to get your employer to agree to do that stuff, just realize, like, I mean, you could point out to them, like, developers have been doing this for literally decades. Like, <laughs> this, this has been saving man hours for teams forever. Uh... Oh, yeah, Surly Dev, yep. Uh, I don't know which podcast you listen to, but yes. Uh, the occasionally putting two and two together. I, my brain does that kind of stuff all the time, and so I have to explain, like, I, I have to yell at people, I'm like, don't, don't talk about stuff that could potentially be spoilers. And even if you think it's not a spoiler, it's probably a spoiler. And I'm like, because my brain will just kind of do it, and I'm not trying, like, it just happens. My brain, my brain does stuff without me trying to do it, which is kind of annoying sometimes, because, um... So uh, I'm, I'm playing in a game called uh, Gloomhaven. It's a board game. Uh, it's a legacy board game. Uh, so the game changes as you play it. It's kind of like uh, shorthand D and D. Uh, anyway, um, so you don't actually so you unlock different characters that you can play as you play the game. And I don't know what they are. Now here's a problem. The game Gloomhaven is on Steam, and Steam showed an advertisement, and I saw a picture of a character on there, and I, my brain immediately went, wait a minute, that guy's head looks kind of like the face that is on the box in that game. I bet that's the character I'm about to unlock. And so, even though I don't know what it is or anything like that, I already know what it looks like, and, and I'm like, dang it! I'm like, I'm intentionally trying to avoid spoilers in this stupid advertisement. They showed a picture of the character, and I'm like... And I'm like, all I saw was like the outline of a head, and my brain immediately was like, yep, that's him. And I'm like, thanks, brain. What are you doing? I didn't tell you to work. I didn't tell you to do that. <laughs> uh, but is it really a spoiler if it comes from the Twitch chat? You can't... Uh, yeah, so... Uh, yeah, no, no, no. For Twitch chat... Yeah, Twitch chat's fine. Twitch chat just trolls you all the time. It doesn't tell you anything real. Uh, and Surly, um, what podcasts are you listening to? I would love to know. And is there another uh, coding exercise we want to we want to work on while we're chatting about stuff? What, what do you want about Twitch chat is the best? <laughs> no, Miha, I think you meant to do this. I think I think you meant to do that one. Did that not change? Uh, whoops, I typoed it. Menu lime. Haha. <laughs> yeah, helps if you do that. There we go. Yeah, see that. There we go. Uh, do you ever do Code Wars? Uh, Broken Sword. Uh, so we actually used to do Code Wars. Uh, Code Wars? Coding, co co we did Code Wars and Coding Game, both on this stream. Um, probably about a year ago, uh, we did that a handful of times. It was good stuff. Um, and uh, Shoes, uh, welcome. Thanks for that follow. Much appreciated. Can we do a coding challenge that uses generics and interfaces combined? Generics and interface generics and interfaces combined. A coding challenge. I mean, like we can just do some code that that has generics and interfaces. I mean, technically that's an interface, but I think you mean write an interface. Um, I use them in my code all the time. Um, oh, I'm trying to think of an example project that does that um, it would be a good one to show. Uh, coding, coding. First off, um, Code Wars, that's what it's called. So this is Code Wars. Um, we used it a bunch of times in the past. I've got some complaints about it, because uh, it um, it doesn't exactly, like, the, the examples are not always right. I don't, know, I don't know what this is. Is this the one? Um, I think this is it. Yeah, uh, I'm pretty sure that's it. Code Wars. Code Wars. Codewars.com? Yeah, am I... Did I log in with GitHub? Yeah, I did. Okay. There we go. So yeah, we did we did Code Wars back in the day. Um, for just various stuff, just while we are on the stream. Just... It's, uh... <laughs> yeah, so I, d I did end up using a generic interface in there, but yeah, we can we can create them. Um, sadly, I can't show any of my clients' uh, work right now, um, so that one's a little little tough. But 
Um, you can see lots of like um, lots of examples of that kind of stuff. So interfaces are something really important to understand, and this is something that you should all be yelling at me about, which is that um, I have not been keeping up on my Dev Chatter Basics videos. Uh, so for anyone that doesn't know, um, we have a YouTube channel uh, that contains all of our archives of our past episodes of Dev Chatter. Um, so if you missed any of the ones in the past, you can actually find them over there. Uh, but I also have a series on there called Dev Chatter Basics. Uh, and I was working on a few videos uh, for Dev Chatter Basics. They're designed to be uh, covering like the core concepts, the things that are foundational uh, to your programming. Uh, and specifically, they're focused on .NET uh, right now. So they're, here's the things that you really want to understand well in order to make your programming in .NET a little bit easier. Uh, so that's what they are. Um, uh, but I do need to finish the ones that were about um, uh, words, uh, interfaces. So I, I know that I don't have that video done. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so yes, for anyone that doesn't know, uh, this is Code Wars. Uh, it is basically just a place where you can jump in and just do a kata. So, uh, so this one apparently has a C sharp implementation. So you're supposed to make this something or other. I don't know exactly what it is, but it gives you all these test boxes to write code in. Um, it's it's just a place to to do some uh, basic coding exercises if you're so inclined. Uh, so you can hop over here and and try them out. Uh, it always has n unit tests set up here for the .NET developers. And you can choose to do these in different languages. I chose C Sharp, but you could obviously switch to something else. So maybe you want to do it in JavaScript. You can do it in JavaScript. You can hop down here. You could do TypeScript. There's some TypeScript uh, tests that will run against it. Uh, you could do it in F Sharp if you really want to. So some people like F Sharp. There's some F Sharp. So. That is Code Wars, and uh, it is a pretty good site. There's also uh, Coding Game is another one, um, and that one has you like writing some code that's designed to make some some graphics in a game do stuff. So uh, it's a little more interesting, uh, like visually, but um, any of them work for that sort of thing. So really up to you. Okay, so. Um, What is going on? What is this? All right, well, uh, tell you what, um, I am going to wrap up with a couple of things. Uh, so first off, um, I want to thank everybody for hanging out today. Uh, I had a really great stream. It was a lot of fun, and I appreciate the awesome conversations that we had. Uh, again, this is part of the reason why our channel is called Dev Chatter, is uh, because, well, uh, I want us to discuss programming and not just write code the whole time. Uh, so usually on this stream, we're working on our projects, but um, uh, our projects include some interesting things like uh, we've we've had a chat bot that we started working on a long time ago that we're going to need to get back to at some point. Uh, we also have some other interesting projects that we do here on the stream, which uh, includes... Um, you guys may not know that I have this running here, but some may have figured it out. Um, we actually have written a uh, program that ties into Final Fantasy VII. So if you've heard of this game, it's an old JRPG from the 90s, runs on the PlayStation. Um, and we wrote a program that actually integrates with this, and it does some fancy stuff like this so chat actually has control of this game uh, they can do all kinds of interesting stuff so it's actually really cool uh, so that is one of the other cool projects that we we do here on the stream uh, again that is dotnet core um, and obviously if you didn't guess that is tied into the same same program uh, so that's how it was able to match with the the code in the game um, <clears throat> 
Uh, so yes, yeah, so for these overlays that I use, uh, this is an open source project. Uh, the, the one that's rotating around, uh, that is our color switcher uh, that lets you just type in a name and it'll send it down to the thing. Uh, we did that as its own application because we thought, hey, that is its own useful thing. It runs as a system tray application in Windows uh, and you just keep it in there and it'll keep this little web server running that, that lets you do this overlay. Uh, and you can actually, uh, because it, you just add in whatever HTML page you want, uh, you can put any HTML page on there and it'll work just fine. So um, they're out on our GitHub, which you can find at github.com slash devchatter, link in the chat as well as down below. Um, .NET Rocks 13 Minutes of the Moon. Uh, oh, oh, that's that's certainly they have a list of podcasts. Wow, that's a lot of podcasts there. Um, it's really hard to code and chat at the same time, so I appreciate you're doing the stream. Uh, that's not easy. Yeah, Broken Swords. Um, that is, so I can tell you, uh, it is really difficult to code and chat at the same time. I think a lot of people uh, miss on it, like miss just how difficult that is. Um, it is not easy. Um, plus, it, you know, uh, it's fairly draining. So, hence, uh, I usually don't stream for more than uh, like two or three hours. Though I've had some five-hour streams. Um, so. Uh, I want to ask everybody to hang out for a little bit because I am planning on us raiding, us, uh, raiding over to another streamer that is live right now and is writing some code uh, and is another member of the live coders. Uh, so hopefully um, you'll all head over there, say hi. Uh, and if you are one of the subscribers to our stream, like Miha is, and have our awesome little hi emote that you can see, uh, that's our Chatosaurus. He's got a little grabber because he's got short arms. Let's him reach stuff. Uh, so if you do have access to our emotes, be sure to uh, use those when we get over there. Um, but I want to click one other thing before we wrap up, and that is I want to roll our credits, because I like to roll the credits. Uh, so I want to make sure that I thank SNB for cheering in the stream today and also for hanging out as one of our moderators, and Stoolpenner as well for hanging out uh, and being a moderator. Uh, I want to thank these wonderful people for following us today, uh, because they're all uh, great and I enjoyed all of the conversations that we had in here, so thank you for hanging out and chatting with me, everyone. And Nate and Smart Asky, thank you very much for those Twitch Prime subs today. Uh, you both now have some awesome emotes. And uh, Romaine, uh, thank you for following as well. And anyone else that is in the chat, if you are interested in being here for future episodes, to be involved in these discussions, chat with us, uh, maybe write a little bit of code, um, well, click the follow button, and that is the way to get notified. Um, so thank you everyone for hanging out today. Uh, I am going to have us raid uh, raid another stream and uh, it'll be an interesting one. So do me a favor, you don't have to hang out and watch the stream, uh, but do stick around long enough to say hi when we get there as that is the best thing that you can do for helping to promote the community is to show up and spread the love. So uh, everyone, I hope you enjoyed our stream today. Have a great rest of your day, whether you've still got a whole day left or whether it's your evening. Uh, and enjoy the rest of your weekend and have a great week. Hopefully I will see you sometime during the week, but uh, my schedule is going to be a little crazy. I've got some conference time uh, as well. So take care, everyone. Happy coding. <laughs>